Hi, everybody. My name is Miss Kelly, and I work at the South Bowie branch of the Prince George's County Memorial Library System. Welcome to STEM at Home. We have some fun experiments for you to try today. Our activity today is called No Water Off a Duck's Back, and it was created by Project Wild. Project Wild is an environmental education program that focuses on wildlife. Now, do you think you can tell from the name what our program is about? Yeah, maybe water, maybe ducks. Let's see. Well, today we are going to talk about oil spills and how they affect wildlife. Most of us have heard about big oil spills and seen the pictures of injured, oil-soaked animals. But have you ever thought about how it all really works? What happens when oil spills into water? Do oil and water mix? What does the oil do? And what happens to the birds that are coated in oil? Why is it so dangerous for them? Finally, is there a good way to remove oil from the water? That's what we're gonna look at today. For our first experiment, we are going to look at what happens when oil is spilled in water. Have you ever heard the phrase that oil and water don't mix? Or that some people get along like oil and water? Why do you think that is? Well, I won't get into the chemistry of it today, but basically oil and water don't mix because of the polarity of the molecules and oil floats on the water because it is less dense than water. For this experiment, you will need a shallow pan of water, cooking oil, and a measuring spoon. So let's get started. So you're gonna take about a teaspoon of oil and drop it, measure it out. And we're just going to put it in the water and see what happens. I'm using olive oil because I think it makes it a little bit easier to see. So let's see what happens when we put the oil in the water. That is not super easy to see. Maybe we need a little more light. So we're gonna try putting a light on. And that does help a little bit. That's very interesting. Can you see the bubbles where the light is? That does make an interesting reflection in our camera. So you can see, you can't really see this at all, but there is a bubble here of oil and another bubble and it looks like actually some of the oil is stuck to the bottom of the pan. But what happens when we mix up the oil into the water. Like if this was the ocean and there was a little bit of, of wind or uh, maybe the waves and you see how that spreads the oil all throughout the water. But the water, the oil is actually floating on top of the water you can't really see from the side here, but if you could, you would see that there is a thin layer of oil that is floating on the top of the water. Now you see all the little bubbles of the oil that they're on top of the water, but they're not mixing in. 
They should, certainly have spread out though throughout the whole size of, of the pan, of the tray here. So every bit of the tray is now been contaminated by this oil. Let's try mixing it up super vigorously to see if we can get it to mix in. So we'll try to do some mixing here. Almost looks like it's mixing in. But what happens when it starts to settle? No, it looks like all the oil is just popping right back up to the top. So there we have it, that's our oil spill, our simulation of an oil spill floating on top of, of the water in our ocean. So you can see that the oil doesn't dissolve in the water like sugar or salt, it just sits there floating on top and coating everything it touches. So what do you think will happen to the birds and other wildlife that come into contact with the floating oil? Scientists and conservationists have found that the oil is very damaging to birds and sea life. Seabirds are especially vulnerable, vulnerable to oil spills. They have feathers that, to keep them warm. Their feathers also help them float on the water. When oil covers the birds, their feathers mat together into clumps. This allows cold water to seep between their feathers and their skin. And the birds could actually freeze to death. The oil also destroys the feather's buoyancy or the ability to float. And in, in, and in an effort to keep from sinking, birds work harder than usual. They become exhausted and drown. Another risk is to birds is poisoning. This may happen when they eat fish that have been contaminated with oil. Poisoning can also occur when the birds preen themselves. As they preen, they swallow oil and are poisoned. So let's talk about bird feathers and preening. Have you ever looked closely at a bird feather? I have one right here, a really nice one. Bird feathers are naturally waterproof, but to maintain this, each feather must be aligned properly so that water can't seep through the tiny barbs and barbules that are a part of the vein of each feather. These barbs and barbules hook together like Velcro to form a tight waterproof barrier. Each properly aligned feather overlaps another like shingles on a roof to create an entire waterproof covering for the bird. It's the bird's job to maintain the feather structure. While preening, Birds distribute natural oils, which help in the long-term maintenance of feathers by keeping the feathers supple so alignment can be maintained. Properly aligned feathers will not allow water or air to get in and ensure that the bird can float and stays warm. Every day, birds spend a lot of time preening their feathers to keep them in top condition. Now we're going to look at how a feather is affected when it is coated in oil. Now we're going to look at how a feather is affected when it's coated in oil. For this experiment, you are going to need two containers, one with water and one with cooking oil. You'll need some feathers, a magnifying glass for some close-up observations, some a dishwashing liquid, and lots of paper towels. All right, let's get started. So the first thing we wanna do is look closely at our feathers. Look at the magnifying glass 
and just look at very close just how the structure of a feather works. You can pull apart the, the bits of a feather and then preen them back together for one solid surface. Now let's just try putting a few drops of water on the feather and see what happens. You see how the water just beads right on the feather? It doesn't soak in at all. And if you turn the feather, oh, there goes the water. And now it's barely wet at all. So what happens if we dunk the whole feather in the water? does feel a little wet. We're just going to dry it off with our paper towel. We'll just tap it dry a little bit. And it's still a little damp, but it feels it's drying very quickly. What happens if we try to put some drops of water and on it again. Will it still beat up? And it does. So it, even though it's a little damp, it's still having a waterproof barrier on that feather. So let's do a few of our feathers all at once and see what happens when all the feathers get wet. So soak them really good, swish them around in the water, and then just give them a little shake. So you see when they come out of the water, they are wet, but they're not sticky or anything. So let's dry them off. Just pat, 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 pat. And they're pretty much back to the way they were. Good as new. Ready for flight or keeping the bird warm. But what happens if we put them in oil? So we're gonna take this feather, swish it around in oil. Let's try to scrape off some of the oil there so it's not too messy. And here we have our oil soaked feather. And the first thing I noticed that it is heavier than it was when it was just soaked in water. Let me try patting it down a little bit. It's still a bit heavy and it certainly feels, certainly feels slimy and greasy. And let's try putting a little bit of water on it to see if it still beads. It, it still does. So it's still somewhat waterproof, even though it's oily. But let's try putting all three of the feathers into the oil and see what happens. So we're gonna swish them around Get them good and oily. Definitely want your paper towels. And now the first thing I see is how they kind of stick together. When they were wet before, they didn't really stick together, but now they are kind of clumping together and it's actually a little hard to pull them apart. So that's probably not good for the bird. It probably won't allow the air to be trapped within the feathers to help keep them warm. So let's see what happens when we clean the feathers. So we're going to use a little bit of our soap here and we're going to soap up these feathers. Uh, 
Okay, so when bird rescuers help birds, this is basically what they're doing. They're using soap, using dishwashing soap to clean a bird's feathers. Now I'm just doing three feathers here. Imagine doing a whole bird. Imagine doing 30,000 birds. Imagine doing 300,000 birds. Now I'm gonna rinse these in a clean dish of water to get some of the soap off. All right. So these are fairly clean. I'm gonna get a fresh paper towel to blot them dry. Now, not just anybody can help wildlife to clean their, their feathers. It takes a trained professional or a trained volunteer to do it because if you've ever given a pet a bath, you know, sometimes they don't like it. And the birds definitely don't like being washed and it can be very stressful for them. And if you don't do it right, you could injure the bird even worse. So that is something that uh, you need to be trained to do. So I've washed these and you can see that they look intact, but they're a little, they're not as spread out as they were. Let's see, I have another untouched feather here that has not been in the oil. And look at how narrow and closed in this one, this one is, and as opposed to this one. Now imagine if the bird was trying to fly with these feathers, they might not work as well. So even though it's been cleaned, it's certainly not drying as fast. I mean, these are still wet. Because when you, even when you clean a bird's feathers, you remove a lot of the natural oils that helps keep them waterproof. So let's see what happens when we put them both in, back in water now, now that they've been cleaned. I mean, certainly we see they don't really dry very well. So this is one of the oiled ones that we've cleaned. This is the fresh one. This one, that barely even looks like it's wet, even though it was in the water. And this one is still wet. So what happens if we drop some drops of water on these? Let's see if they both beat up the same. We're gonna put these upside down, I think. Whoop, that was a little bit too much water on that one. See this one, the water just runs right off. This one doesn't beat up quite as well. And you know what, the water is not running off. So, it's better to clean the oil off the birds, off the feathers, but it's a long process. And it definitely doesn't leave the bird in the same condition that they were in before they got oiled. So really the best option is to not put oil in the water so the birds don't get covered in oil in the first place. How have the feathers changed? Do you think it will affect the bird's activities? Oil spills can also affect birds that nest near the shore. If the bird is covered in oil and sick, it can't take care of its young. Birds may not be able to find enough food to feed themselves or their chicks. The oil can affect the eggs in the nest too. If birds are nesting at the time of the spill, oil-covered eggs will suffocate the unhatched chicks 
and breeding females will lay eggs with thinner shells that can easily break. So for our next experiment, we are going to look at how oil affects eggs. For this experiment, we will need cooking oil, three hard boiled eggs, all in glass jars. We will need a timer, a magnifying glass so we can inspect our eggshells, a spoon to help get the shells, the eggs out of the containers, and lots of paper towels can this one, because this one can get messy. So we have three eggs. One of them has been in the oil for almost five minutes. One has been in the oil for just about 15 minutes and one for just about 30 minutes. So when our timer goes off in about three minutes, it will be time to take the eggs out and to see what effect uh, the oil has had on the eggs. So when we do that, we will need to wipe the eggs off a little bit uh, because they're very oily and sloppy. I have a little dish of water too, just to rinse them off to make it a little bit easier. Also, I have here just some plates to make it just a little bit easier to see the eggshells against, uh, against the, uh, the white surface. So it'll make it a little bit easier to see what we're doing here. And we still have about 2.30. So we are going to uh, skip through this a minute and get straight to our timer going off. So the timer has gone off. So it is time to, I'm just gonna go ahead and pull all the eggs out and then we will open them one by one and see if there's a difference. So they are gonna be very sloppy. So it helps to use the spoon woo, to try to get them out. They're slippery. And I'm just gonna wipe this down a little bit. Okay, so this is our five minute egg. You know what, I'm gonna take our little timer here and just put it right here. That's our five minute egg. I'm gonna get this out of the way. Five minute egg. This one is our 15 minute egg. All right, dry this off a little bit. These are very slippery, so you do need to be careful with these and use lots of paper towels. Okay, so this is our 15 minute egg. Lift that back a little bit so we can see it. And move that out of the way. And finally, our egg that has been in here for 30 minutes. Okay. All right. Oh my goodness, my hands are very oily now. So let me get another paper towel. Lots of paper towels here. Okay. And this is our 30 minute egg. Let me put that back here a little bit so we can see it. Okay, 15 minutes. All right, so I'm gonna use the plate to crack open the egg because I think it makes it just a little bit easier to see. So let me wipe this down just a little bit more. Okay, still sticky. All right, so I'm just gonna crack this on the end of the jar here just to make it easier to get it started. Okay. So we're gonna crack open the eggs just like we're making egg salad or deviled eggs. So you do wanna make sure that these eggs are hard boiled 
before you start this. Otherwise, that could get really messy. And I would say that the shell is a little brittle here and it's kind of fallen apart in my hands and it's also kind of sticking to the egg but sometimes hard-boiled eggs do that so I don't know if that's because of the experiment or it's just a tough egg. Well, let me go ahead and finish opening it. All right, there we have our first egg. It's a little sloppy. I don't think I'd want to serve a deviled egg with a sloppy shell like this, but I'm going to go ahead and rinse it in this water just to get some of the extra eggshell off. So this is our first egg. It's been sitting for five minutes. Let's try our second egg. I do have another plate here. So this is our 15 minute egg. So this is our five minute egg. This is our 15 minute egg. Go ahead and put that right here. I'll crack this over here on the jar just to get it started. Okay, it looks like the membrane is still intact. And this one might be uh, peeling a little bit easier than the last one. But I think the uh, shell does feel just a little bit more brittle. Well, that certainly peeled a lot easier. Let me go ahead and rinse this just a little bit. Okay. This is my 15 minute egg. Okay, you know what? I'm gonna have to put these on one plate because I only have two plates. So this is my five minute egg. This is my 15 minute egg. Now we're doing the last egg, maybe the last egg. This one is our 30 minute egg. So let me crack this, get it started here. Like I say, it's easier to peel. And you know what? This actually feels kind of oily in the inside, whereas the others didn't really. Yeah, that was very easy to peel. I think maybe the shell might have felt just a little bit thinner. It's a little hard to tell, but maybe if we look close up, if we look with our magnifying glass, we can see if there's some difference in the eggs. I'm not sure they look a lot different. Yeah, if I look close up, 
I think the 30 minute egg looks a little more, I don't know, pocked than the other ones, but it certainly feels different. And when I feel the eggs, you know, this one feels just slimier, even though they all were wet. So this is our 30 minute egg. And so just out of curiosity, I have one more egg. This one, I soaked a little bit earlier today and I let this one soak for hey, about three hours. So this one certainly had a good soaking of oil. So let's see how this one might be affected. And I think I'm gonna use this same plate I used for the 30 minute egg for our three hour egg and see if it makes much of a difference to leave an egg soaking for three hours. Well, it certainly feels sticky. So this is our three hour egg. Rinse this one off. Dry it off just a little bit. Now, another thing you might look at is like how much do eggs, eggs weigh? Is there a difference in the weight? Is there a difference in the texture? You know, I think these two do feel heavier than those do. I don't know, it makes an interesting experiment. I'm not sure that the results are crystal clear. Uh, I do think the eggshells do seem a little bit thinner uh, with the three hour egg and the 30 minute egg. But try the experiment at home and see, uh, and see how it works for you and see what conclusions you come up with. Finally, we are going to look at how we might clean up an oil spill. Scientists use many methods to try to remove oil from the water. Skimmers remove oil from the surface of the water. This method requires calm ocean waters. Booms are large floating barriers that round up the oil and keep it away from sensitive nesting areas. Vacuums remove oil from beaches and the water surface. Dispersants act as detergents and break up the oil spill. Dispersants are rather like dishwashing soap. Sorbents are large absorbent materials that soak up the oil. There are chemical agents that can break down the oil and also microorganisms or biological agents will also, can also break down or remove the oil. Controlled burning can effectively reduce the amount of oil in water if done properly. However, it can only be done in low wind conditions and even so can cause air pollution. Sometimes watching and waiting is the best method particularly in an ecological sensitive area, because you don't want the cure to be worse than the disease. Many of these methods for removing oil from the water can cause their own problems and scientists have to be aware of that and use them very carefully. Now we are going to take the tray from the first experiment and see if we can remove the oil.
So now we are going to take the tray from the first experiment and see if we can remove some of the oil. For this experiment, we will need the shallow tray with the water and the oil in it. We will need a sponge, a cotton ball. These are our absorbents for absorbing. A skimmer. So we have two skimmers. We have a skimmer from my fish tank and also a spoon, which can be used as a skimmer. And then finally, some dishwashing liquid, which is going to act as our dispersant. So let's see which methods uh, will work best today. So some of the methods I just mentioned, I'm not going to use. Uh, I'm not going to use the boom method because it's kind of too late. Our uh, oil has spread throughout uh, our basin, so it's not going to help to contain it. It's, it's pretty much everywhere. Uh, I'm not going to set it on fire. That would uh, I don't have the safety materials to do that. So, but let's try the methods that I do have. So we're going to start with the skimmers, I think. So there's a big patch here. So I'm going to try to just get underneath it and try to get a little bit up on my spoon. And this is my dish where I'm going to put all the reclaimed oil. So when there's a real heavy spot of oil like this one, the skimmer actually works fairly well. If you look, that's pretty much straight oil. So that's not too bad, but can I use the spoon for all these tiny little droplets? I think that is just not going to work. So I got a little bit out with the spoon. So let me try the big skimmer next. So this is a fish skimmer and we're just going to try skimming this through the water. And it looks like it's gotten a fair bit of oil off. Let me try to clean some of this off. And it does look like our tank is a fair bit cleaner. So that's not too bad. All right, so the skimmer did a pretty good job and you see there's a fair bit of oil on it, but there's still oil in our basin. So I'm just gonna wipe off just a little bit of that oil on the skimmer before I set it down here. And now let's try our absorbent materials. So we will try the cotton ball first. Now the problem with the cotton ball is it's not very big, but if I look for some of the bigger spots that are still in here, maybe I can pick some of them up. It is a little hard to see, but you see there's a little bit you can see a little bit of the oil here on the cotton ball, so it's picking something up. Could you imagine doing this through the whole ocean though? That would take a very long time. I think it does help around the edges a little bit, but now I think my cotton ball is getting more water than oil, so it's not really working as well. So now we're going to try the sponge. This I can do a larger surface, And then I can squeeze it out. Well, it's certainly better, but I do still see oil in my water. So if this was a fish tank, I probably want, would not want to put my fish in it. It would be a, too, a little bit too oily for my fish. So let's try our last method, and that is our dish detergent. So this is our dispersant. And let's see what happens when we put in a little bit of dish detergent. Well, that has cleared up the oil quite well. It's moved it all the way around the edges and it's totally cleared out this area 
of, of the tray. And let me try giving it just a little mix because I still see some oil around the edges. But I have to say that worked much better than any of the other methods. But the problem with that, of course, is, is now this is soapy water. Would you want to put your goldfish back in soapy water? He probably wouldn't like that. It probably wouldn't be very good for him. But this is fairly clean. But if you do look, all the remaining oil is stuck around the edges. And when it gets disturbed, oh look, it just goes right back into the water. So this would be like if there's oil that's on the shore, then that's going to get into your bird's nests and it's going to get into the turtles and the animals living near the water. And every time there's a big rain or waves, it's just going to end up going back into the water. So that's not such a great solution either. that and you've got a bunch of soapy water. So you don't know what the chemicals from the dispersants might do to the, key, to the creatures that you're trying to save. So the truth is there are not a lot of great methods for cleaning up oil spills. Really the best method is to not spill oil. I would encourage you to try these experiments at home. Although I've shown you as best I can the effects of oil and water and on bird feathers and eggs, you really need to see it up close and feel it for yourself. The brittle eggshells, the way a feather velcros itself together to stay waterproof, and how much heavier the feather is when it's soaked in oil, and how oily the tray is even after you disperse the oil. But please remember that when you finish your experiments, you must dispose of your materials carefully. The soapy water in your tray, tray should be safe to pour down the drain, but not the whole jar of oil. Never put oil or grease in your drains. It's bad for wildlife and it'll clog your drains. The best way to dispose of it is to, is to take it for recycling at the county household hazardous waste acceptance site in Upper Marlboro. You can also just close up the jar, tie it up in a plastic bag, and put it in the trash. Just be really careful not to break the jar. Well, thank you for joining us for our STEM at Home program. Please make sure to check the library's website, our YouTube page, and the Facebook page for more of our great activities. Thank you, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.